welcome back to the first Philips African Dialogues. We are talking about Millennium Development Goals 4 and 5. Thank you so much for joining us yet again. One of the things that I did yesterday in preparation for our discussion today is I decided I was going to take to the streets and just go to average people in places where I really believe that these MDGs are mostly targeted at. And it was absolutely surprising to me that not a single person, and we spoke to a lot of people, knew what the MDGs were. We went to different hospitals, and at different hospitals we met up with nurses. And just outside we asked the nurses, do you know what the Millennium Development Goals are? Not a single nurse could tell us what the Millennium Development Goals are. And I'd like to, to throw this, this question to government just in terms of awareness, because it seemed to me yesterday that people don't know about this. And, and especially when you're talking about the people, the healthcare providers, you would, you would think that they would know. So just in terms of awareness, how much awareness is government trying to get out there about the MDGs, about community involvement, and about how we're trying to get there? Yeah, um, I think uh, the, 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 the challenge there might have been that uh, we haven't engaged uh, aggressively with the community on, on the MDGs. But of course, you will find other communities know about the MDGs now looking at the community level. Now when we go to facility level, our hospitals, um, we should, because uh, the maternity, I think maybe also that is the, the, the fragmented approach that you look, you find that mainly staff who are in maternity and who are in uh, your antenatal care setup would know about that. Now, depending whether somebody who is dealing with surgery will have an idea on that, uh, I think that's a challenge. If that's what we have found out, it means we haven't done our job uh, properly. But uh, mainly uh, maternity and uh, your pediatric staff, uh, I think we shouldn't be having a challenge of people not knowing what the MDGs are. And also then it shows maybe lack also of, uh, I mean, they, they should be listening to radio, watching TV, and they, 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 it is not necessary that uh, people who have received uh, training on MDGs but they should have had some information on the MDGs. David, I'd like to come to you. Just in terms of involvement and, on all, and all the people I've spoken about, whether it's healthcare providers, whether it's the community itself, being involved in, in reaching these goals, how important is that? And just in your experience, again, you know, bringing in your global experience of, of involving everybody, because this is an issue that affects us all, just in terms of how important that is for us to be able to reach those goals. I think for us it's very important, you know, we, uh, we're in this because we want to make a difference, you know, we want to help improve and save the lives of the mothers and children that we serve as an industry. And um, what we've seen over the years, you know, in, uh, in some of the uh, markets in Central Europe, for example, or in uh, other parts of the world, is that when some of this equipment has been uh, appropriately adopted, if, uh, if mothers are going to antepartum fetal monitoring tests throughout the pregnancy, the chances of catching an at-risk pregnancy is much higher than if you did not do that. And the countries that have adopted that systematically have uh, in intuitively much uh, better results, you know. And similarly, if uh, we can have access to infant warming solutions, if you go to India where um, some mothers are having to leave the hospital with children who only weigh 13, 1400 grams and are actually having to hold them over warm fires or under a light bulb to try to keep them warm with appropriate poor outcomes, you know, trying to get access to infant warming again to save those children did, did get delivered early preterm uh, deliveries makes a huge, huge difference as well. So again, we, we can, the, mo the mo more we can do to bring appropriate equipment, get the equipment in place at the right place at the right price point to do the training, the clinical effectiveness of, of using it is, is our contribution to that. Professor Van uh, I, I think the, <coughs> the, the fundamental question that was asked was community involvement in health service delivery and how, you know, the fact that they don't know about the Millennium Development Goals is material in, uh, in health service delivery. But one of the reasons for introducing them was it was a kind of a top-down way of creating accountability within governments who themselves aren't actually being responsive to the general public. So something w that's problematic with the health service in South Africa is that we don't actually have 
a, uh, a health system designed to be responsive to communities. It's designed to do the opposite. It's a cold system. Uh, it disregards them. So at the moment, the Millennium Development Goals are purely a signal to government that it's not performing and the, and the accountability pressure is not necessarily coming from the general public, which is a problem. Dr. Bumela, I'd like to talk about bedside manner. It sounds like a very simple thing, but one of the, one of the concerning issues yesterday about, about just how moms are treated when they go to the clinic or how patients are treated. And it was very concerning for me because as we were doing this, I just met a mother who had just come back from the clinic and she said when she went there, it had been a clinic, it wasn't the clinic she'd initially registered her child at. And she was insulted by the staff. She was treated so badly. And as I was speaking to her, I said, did this experience make you feel that you don't, she had been taking her child to get a vaccine? And I asked her, did this experience make you feel like you don't want to go back again? And she said, yes, but I do know that it's important for my child to get the vaccine. That's why I stayed. That was one example. And so many women I spoke to yesterday had received such bad service and just such poor quality treatment as patients that it is a concern that people might be afraid to go. How do we change that? The minister has, has been vocal on those issues in acknowledging that uh, one of the challenges in the especially with the public sector institutions is the attitude of staff and uh, the waiting queues. And what you've just described speaks to those uh, two problems. I think we all know what we desire with regard to those, to those issues, the improvements, which way we, we, we would like things to go. And uh, I think that speaks to the performance of the, of the health system or the health service delivery system. What is required, we've found, is, uh, is knowledge, skills, commitment, and leadership. And these are some of the things that form the DNA of service delivery within the private health institutions. And it is these things that we think uh, we should be sharing across the board within the South African health system. Professor, I had, I had asked you this and said, you know, I mean, you, lo you work a lot in this field. Your experience as well has not been different to what I experienced yesterday when I was speaking to these women. I mean, I think if you speak to many people working in the public health sector, and I see many colleagues in the audience here, most people will tell you the same thing. I mean, if I was going to prioritize what I would like uh, practitioners in the field to do. It wouldn't be to know about the Millennium Development Goals. It would be actually that they performed uh, their services it, it, with appropriate attitudes and appropriate level of skill. I think that's the, first, um, that's the most important thing because if they did that, the Millennium Development Goals would be, become a given. And so I think that, that and, and I think that this is one of the things that, 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 that is really challenging us. We've heard the very high expenditure that we've currently got on the public sector uh, in this country relative to the outcomes that we're getting. So what is the gap? And I think our real concern is the gap is probably around the skills of the personnel and the attitudes of the personnel. And there are clearly many, many excellent people working in the public sector. But, but the, the anecdotes that you told would be the ones that would be repeated widely. And that's why one of the big issues we have to tackle is getting universal standards into the public sector so that it isn't acceptable any longer that uh, you don't have adequate equipment that's minimal equipment, for example, in an obstetric unit, which is quite common. This debate can continue, but I think, I think one of the issues that we would like to do in this discussion is come up with some kind of solutions. I would like to ask you, David, just in terms of partnerships, because that is a big thing, just in terms of partnerships, how can the public and the private sector come together in terms of helping? And when we're talking about private sector, I'm not just talking about private hospitals or you know, uh, practitioners that are working in the, but businesses as in general, coming on board and being able to help us to achieve these Millennium Development Goals. Well, I'm not sure I can answer too well about uh, the private and public sectors in South Africa coming together, but uh, I can say that we are uh, certainly committed to working with both private and public sectors, and we recognize that there's a lot more contribution that could be made, I think, in the um, 
in the public sector that uh, we're looking at a lot more focus than we have possibly done in the past. And again, it goes back to the previous comment that maybe the uh, requirements or the uh, ability to pay for certain types of equipment may be somewhat different because of the funding mechanisms and therefore we're trying to address that with appropriate levels of equipment at the right price points to help to serve both communities. Well, from what I'm hearing what you're saying, there does seem to be opportunity there for the, for the two sectors to work together. Of course, I think so, yes, yes. I mean, I'm not privy to the uh, details of the uh, debates going on locally because I'm not always obviously here in this country, but uh, the sense from my colleagues who are much closer to this than I am is, is yes. Dr. Woodmiller, I'd like to ask you, how do we do it, just in terms of, those, of that partnership and business coming on board as well in the private sector to be able to help the public sector for us to be back on track? I think uh, there's things that you can do immediately without needing to uh, really go into a lot of trouble. And, uh, and I would like to start with an example. When there was a public sector strike and uh, there were newborns that were stranded uh, around the Gauteng, the, the, an arrangement was found where those uh, newborns who that couldn't be serviced in the public sector because of the strike were immediately taken care of uh, in, the public, in the private sector. And the reason I'm making this example is this. If the care that they ended up receiving hadn't been offered because of that situation, they might have died and they could be part of the, they could have made these statistics to make it even worse. Then the question that we must ask is, that's just a given situation of a public strike, but uh, the challenges of service delivery and uh, being able to provide services when they are needed are widespread in the country and are well documented. And how many opportunities then are missed from, for instance, uh, being just willing to take patients that uh, are not able to be serviced by a district hospital that's currently running, not on strike, but just somehow understaffed, not having equipment, when there is a private hospital that is nearby. These are opportunities that are immediately available to us. Well, we are going to hand over to the floor right now. We did see a few questions in the break. Good evening. I'm Lillian Paramore from Sensitive Midwifery. We run a magazine and a symposium for midwives. From a training perspective, I'm delighted at what Philips is doing. I would like to say, though, I would like to see an integration of high tech and low tech. It's using the high tech, but knowing that there's other things, and together it will work best. It really will, and I'd like to see that going on. I'd love government not to hide behind acronyms like MDGs and achievement. I'd love government to hear the voices when lots of us out there reach out and are trying to do something, but the, the process is so laborious and there's so much red tape, it makes it very difficult. We still, there are lots of private public initiatives going on that are probably too small for government to know about, but I think they should. And maybe if I can address this side of the floor, I really was interested to hear what you said about hearing what the women's experiences are. One of the most important thing is they're not patients when it comes to mothering and pregnancy. They are women from many different cultures and they are f petrified of hospitals. They need a more homely place to come to. I suppose in that I heard, I did hear a bit of a question and that was just the red tape of, of, of you know, organizations or, or individuals that would like to do something and it being very difficult for them to be able to do so. What is government doing to be able to lessen that red tape? I, I don't know uh, in which province is she working because uh, if, uh, if you are talking to Houding, we, we, we've worked with uh, um, NGOs that are providing 
package of uh, napkins and something to women during antenatal. The, the Chris Anibara, we have worked with those women in, uh, in other hospitals at Timbisa. Mainly we work with uh, uh, those who come to us and say, look, we want to offer this. But of course there are processes because we need to know whether all the things they are doing are in line with what government wants to do. For example, we wouldn't want somebody who will bring a, 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 a Vaseline in, in, in a situation where we are not using that in our facility. And also what I, I want to say is that it's important that also the, the, the community out there and some experts like, like her sh should also acknowledge that government has done a lot of things. Now we're talking about partnership. We've got uh, sessional doctors who are working in our facilities that we pay for, for working there. And there is that partnership that we're having. But of course it's got its own challenges where then people just, uh, 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 we can't account for them, whether they are doing, if it's supposed to do three sessions, are they doing that? We need to look at that. And when we try to look at that, then people then go out and say, there's red tape. But we need to have processes to, to control that. If you are saying we are going to do this, are you doing it? So then we are able to, to pay you correctly. David, I would like to ask you the, the, the question about low tech, high tech, that coming together and, and, and seeing, you know, bringing the, the midwife on board. How much discussion are you having with individuals like that, with, with practi practitioners like she is? Well, uh, a lot. I mean, we're, we're uh, basically uh, assessing the, the needs at all elements of the continuum of care, starting from the midwife, from the nurses, looking what their requirements are. A lot of the training that uh, we deliver is not just about using the equipment, it gets down to basic uh, you know, clinical care as well. And I think um, when it gets to the point where sometimes even in some of the developed markets we serve, uh, it would be a surprise sometimes to see that um, physicians in Germany, the United States, in the UK uh, today are not uh, totally um, able to interpret, for example, fetal heart rate uh, traces and what we're trying to do there is to utilize technology, utilize algorithm developments that will build in the uh, screening interpretation right there into the equipment that you take a lot of that burden away and maybe you can segregate the at-risk uh, non-stress test, for example, in antipartum monitoring and, and then focus in the clinician on looking at the mother that comes out as being an at-risk patient. And, uh, and so there are means, I think, of uh, addressing the, the, uh, the question that we, we do try to combine the best of high tech, but also recognizing that the low tech is obviously very important as well. We have more questions from the audience. Robert Adams, I'm an obstetrician and a referral hospital in the government sector. And I think that the panel has highlighted one of the biggest failings in this country, and that is that the primary healthcare sector is really in collapse that the experience of the patients at the clinics is shocking. And I've certainly had an example of this today from a mother with a stillbirth. To me, a person, a nurse who has this kind of attitude either doesn't care or feels insufficiently competent in the position that she's in. And I honestly don't believe that our nurses do not care. And I'd like to know what the government is doing, what the authorities are doing to carry on with continuous education, in-service education for the people who are out there on their own handling the patients day to day. If we're looking at one of the points, there of the four points that are in NHI, is to look at the health system. And then how do you look and correct the health system, bring back quality Okay, and also are looking at quality education, skilling for, for, for health professionals. But uh, we are dealing with uh, primary health care head on with NHI. That is why then you have these, these 10 pilot sites, which uh, one of them is one in the province. And what we are looking at then there is that we are looking at primary re-engineering. We are looking at primary health care. What, what is it that we can do better? Or f taking from the gains that we have made on, on primary health care. Uh, because it's not the whole country that is as fortunate as we are in how the way facilities are. Uh, your five kilometer radius, we, we, we've almost covered that one in, in some of the areas. But it's important also to note that when we look at, I've mentioned the core standards that we're looking at. We're also looking at the six point plan 
that is looking at uh, uh, facility improvement, your safety of nurses and doctors, cleanliness, uh, the attitude, not only attitude of, of uh, health professionals, also the attitude of the community. We need also to look at those issues. Now on the issue of uh, 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 training, continuous education, we, we do those. Uh, and, and, and I think uh, also people need to understand that your, your, your mortality meetings are still part of continuous education. And sometimes you end up with people thinking that when you talk to continuous uh, education or development or, or professional, you must take them out to some but resort so that then it can be said to but be... But Director, with all uh, these training. things in place and, and the people that we spoke to, Professor says that she's had the same experience and spoken to lots of people, with all of that it doesn't seem to be working and the people that are going in to get the care that they're supposed to be getting, that attitude that you're talking about is still in the state where women are not getting the care that they need and, and their children are suffering for it. If they're scared to go and they're going to have that kind of treatment, who is accountable to make sure that that is not happening? Now, I've said earlier on that we have this governance of the, 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 the board, hospital board, you have uh, community health committees, but at the end of the day, the, 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 the facility manager is the one responsible. And if the community cannot get satisfaction for the, from the facility manager, then they escalate their problems. And some problems have been sorted out. It's not like uh, nothing is happening. This government is not doing anything. Now, the issue, as I mean, the issue of, uh, of attitudes, if, if I've got an attitude and I come from this community, then we, we need a debate on attitude and, uh, and community. Uh, health workers who come from a particular community and then they give attitude to that community. We need to, to look at all those things. We're going to take one more question from the floor. Thank you. My observation in the discussion, there's too much of us and them between public sector and private sector. Central to the debate and discussion this evening is we have the woman and the child. Whose woman and whose child is this? And until time comes, we all take accountability. I believe there will be initiatives, there will be efforts irrespective of the, F of, of, of the sector to say, let me do my little bit to make a difference. To me, if that attitude can prevail in the midst of providers, who are the only hope of this nation to take us somewhere. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I think uh, that summarizes um, the way forward for all of us. And uh, I think uh, we, we really have to think very carefully about uh, the child and the, and, the, and the woman, the vulnerable members of our population and the opportunities that we could give them or we could deny them. And uh, that will help us to refocus uh, all of us uh, across the spectrum, both public and private. Well, we are going to take closing comment. Director, I'll start with you. I, I think for me, we, 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 we need to move away from this blaming. Uh, so because sometimes you get the feeling that uh, whatever efforts that government is uh, taking are, 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 are actually shut down. And uh, I think uh, if people shut down whatever efforts we try to, to come up with, it, it's good if they give us suggestions. Because we put suggestions on the table like the national health insurance, which when you look at it, it's looking at the, the health system, there are about 20 non-negotiables that has been put there that uh, we must look at, including uh, drug supply, supply chain management. Those are non-negotiables, they must be there. But it, it wouldn't seem, any, especially if now we're discussing the issue of MDGs unknown by the, the, the the health professional. Now we're talking NHI, which is something that uh, it's new to this country, but also is unknown. Or if it's known, people are shooting it down because uh, they don't seem to agree with certain points in it and so on. 
The, the important thing then is to go back to, to the basics. For me, the basics were, are three things. That uh, we, we need to make sure that we, we, we empower the community, we educate the community. We need also to make sure that we educate and support health professionals. We need to look at improving our health system. Because if we can improve the health system, as we are doing with NHI, which also include the components of uh, skills development, infrastructure improvement, meaning equipment, plus your clinic setup. There's a study currently that is conducted in Gauteng, uh, the city of Johannesburg, and the, the, the city of Eteguin. They're looking at, are, are the current facilities equipped enough? Because we find women or patients sitting outside the facility why? Because we don't have uh, space. The design also of our clinics from, we are not going to, to blame apartheid forever, but the design, structural designs are, are not also good. Dr. Bermela? The minister and the leaders in government have stated their commitment to improving the health system. And we are very excited as players within that sector of the possibilities and the role that we can play. And we think that uh, it is in that spirit that uh, uh, South Africans uh, should now uh, try to leave the past behind and uh, look into the future and leverage what is working well in the country and learn from each other. David Russell. I think I really appreciated the uh, gentleman's last comment to uh, conclude the debate here today and uh, as the industrial partner in the discussion, um, I can uh, assure you that everyone who works in the mother and child care business at Philips, we every single day never fail to recognize that at the end of the day it is about the mother and about the child and the patient that is being served by the equipment that we produce and that motivates I think everyone that works in this field within our company. Uh, I think <coughs> going forward, South Africa has to um, introduce measures. It's not good enough to, um, to have good intentions. And um, sort of uh, woolly proposals about the future and suggesting sort of approaches which involve moral suasion, that people kind of do the right thing. It's actually nothing you can bank on at the end of the day. Health systems are tough systems to run. They require people to put in hard systems that actually make a difference, that affect the behavior of the people that run them. We don't, we have no proposals that actually impact on the behavior of anybody within the system at this point in time. And if we don't, it's very difficult to create any kind of uh, interaction which is necessary between the public and private sectors and also to run the public sector properly. Um, the measures that we require involve uh, what people have done in many other countries, decentralizing the system, putting it closer to the ground, removing, the de depoliticizing the health system so that in fact you're employing people who can run the system and not just somebody who's friends with the MEC. It's people who can actually do the job and then they're held accountable for doing that job with all the mechanisms that come with an accountability framework. We don't have those. They need to be put in place. They're structures and it's not just about n nice sentiments. It's actually structures that are required. Professor mm -hmm. Rees. Well, if we go back to the question of the premise of the discussion, which is how do we reduce maternal and infant mortality, I think that we would all agree on this panel that we, we definitely have to fix the public sector. And, and I do agree that I think there are very serious um, uh, uh, strategies now in place, policies in place, that are really trying to address this. Uh, if we're going to do this, though, we go, we've got to start with bite-sized pieces, because I think people often get glazed by the enormity of what we're trying to fix. And that would bring me to my second point, is in fixing this and in addressing things, we have to say what is driving maternal death, what's driving infant deaths, and then perhaps prioritize things and start to try and fix some of those systems that are the most critical. We do have to look at HIV, it is driving this, and we are looking at that as a country, and I think that that is commendable, at trying to prevent and get proper treatment in. That will have an impact. We have to look at contraception so that women have choices, and that will have an impact 
on both maternal and infant death. We have to then look at what's happening within the health services and, and look at particularly obstetric care, particularly emergency obstetric care, and fix some of those things. Because often if you focus and fix one or two of those things, you can fix the system. If you say there are not drugs, then you fix the drug system. So I would think that one of the things we have to do is prioritize to, uh, the, uh, around the causes of, of what's driving mortality. And then within the context of fixing the public health system, select those things that are the big challenges and really try and address those. And that's how we end our mm. first Philips African Dialogues. Thank you so much for joining us. Enjoy the rest of your viewing right here on CNBC Africa. Mm -hmm.